Hi y'all, so Noel Plum did a video in response to my video, itself a response to a video he did on uh, supposed discrimination in the UK Armed Forces. I'll put a link to it below, it's about 45-50 minutes long. I'm going to try to make my response to his response uh, much shorter than that. Hi Noel, first uh, the pleasantries out of the way. I appreciate the, uh, the wishes of goodwill, uh, I reciprocate them, I hope things are going well for your family, particularly uh, your new kid, your job, I hope everything's going well with your wife. But to be quite frank, as uh, my posting schedule has suggested of late, life has really been kicking me in the teeth. It's just been a cavalcade of friends and family members dropping fucking dead. And on top of that, my best friend slash roommate, with whom I've lived for over 20 years now, has been desperately trying not to die from cancer, uh, which she's doing well with right now. So there's that. So it's been a really hard uh, year and a half or so. But whatever. On to the actual video since I'm not one for uh, whining too much. Now, um, there are two major threads I want to discuss. One is legal and one is um, health or physiology, medical I suppose you could put it. Uh, but before that, I want to address one of the things you brought up at the beginning of your, your video which was about why it was that I brought up the relationship between this argument and feminists with the wage gap and you, you threw it to your audience to have a guess as to why I might have done that. Well, you don't have to guess since I fucking said it outright in the video, but, you know, if you want to guess, I'll give you a couple hints that might help you along the way, one of which is called foreshadowing. It's putting my audience on notice what to look for in your response, because the people who like to talk about this engage in the exact same behavior as feminists when confronted with a discussion about the wage gap. The conclusion is that a wage gap exists that is exclusively caused by sexism, by the patriarchy, and all that remains to be done is the mental gymnastics that are required to make every piece of uh, evidence, real or imagined, factual or fictitious, fit that, uh, that, that pre-established, pre-ordained, predetermined conclusion. A wise man, now you're a clever man, but a wise man would have thought uh, gee, maybe this is a warning that I might want to uh, not engage in that kind of behavior, and uh, you completely ignored it and decided to engage in that very behavior. Just like a feminist trying to support the proposition that a wage gap that is caused exclusively by patriarchy, uh, the sexism exists. By, it's caused by misogyny. It could possibly be no other thing. So, congratulations. Now, one uh, thing I want to talk about right at the outset on the legal issue is the moral implications. Just fucking with you, I read your comments and I know you thought that was the strategy I was going to try to use. I'm not. Um, there is a, a real difference between you and me, Noel Plum, uh, and I'm going to do this in a bit of a reverse order. So like a feminist will use spurious sources, you used a spurious source. You talked about the College of Policing in the UK, a study, um, a paper that I had also read. And you uh, advert to a case that is there and cited, Alcock versus whoever, uh, the constable of the whatever the place. It's very interesting that uh, you would bring that up. Now, you claim uh, quite properly that I've mentioned I've worked in law enforcement in the United States, and that gives me some insight into how the law works. And by uh, parity of reason, reasoning, you are using that here to say that these police officers or this police agency should know what it's talking about. This is the Dunning-Kruger effect. Uh, one of the things about knowing something about a natural field, and this is crucial, is knowing the limitations of one's knowledge. You're talking about employment law. Law enforcement doesn't deal with employment law. Law enforcement deals with criminal law. Uh, I'll try to give you an example as to why you wouldn't ask a police officer or a law enforcement agency about employment law or contract law or really things outside of criminal law. And it's simply because they don't study. They don't study a great deal on in rim matters. They anyway. If I would be very surprised in either of our two countries if more than five percent of police officers could answer the following question, even though police officers routinely are involved in uh, trespassing cases and theft cases. Uh, suppose that a farmer's livestock uh, are going missing. Some of his sheep are just disappearing. This could be a. You can imagine this is happening in Scotland, for no particular reason. And uh, a police officer decides to do a stakeout and he catches someone absconding in the dead of night with, uh, with one of the sheep. 
And uh, so that, that's the, the factual predicate. And then the question to be put to the officer to be decided is, is it possible for a usufructuary to steal that livestock? Most police officers, uh, I would be surprised if more than 5% got this uh, answer correct, uh, if able to answer that correctly, don't know what the fuck that is. It is, that's because it's not a police officer's question, even though it bears directly on whether or not a crime has been committed. That is a lawyer's question. One of the things about training police officers is you train them on what they need to know, and you also train them when they don't know what the fuck they're talking about, what the fuck they're dealing with, when to pick up the phone to call the prosecutor to ask, hey, lawyer, use your lawyering skills to give me some advice here. Because they are a bit like a paramedic. They have, they have, scope of, they have a scope of practice beyond which it is imprudent or unlawful for them to go without advice. Not really unlawful. The, maybe, depends. <clears throat> that could get, that's actually a tricky legal question. Anyway, so they know when to pick up the phone to call someone who knows more than they know. And the little employment thing there, um, it's interesting <clears throat> because also from the College of Policing in their library, you can find, I'll put a link to it below, and you go down to, I think it's paragraph 4.1.58 or something like that. Anyways, footnote 58, footnote 59, they're talking about the very same case. Now, this is a, a, a study put together by one of your crown ministers and submitted to Parliament, which, uh, contrary-wise to what is put in the College of Policing, I'll put a link to all this for everybody else, too. Contrary-wise to what's uh, included there, it classes this as indirect discrimination, whereas the police paper, the one that you want to cite, classes it as direct discrimination. And the actual legal case, which I can't get access to because it's behind a paywall and I'm cheap, so I could, but I'm cheap, uh, <clears throat> the bit of the holding that I've managed to be able to actually track down the two or three lines of it refers to it as just direct discrimination. Uh, but in the repository of cases in the UK, it's listed under indirect discrimination law. So it's very interesting that, the, that you have the four sources I can find, half of which call it direct, the other half call it indirect. So it's very curious what it actually is. Uh, and it's also completely irrelevant to England and Wales, which is what that, uh, the College of Policing thing is about. Because that case comes from Northern, I Northern Ireland. I would be very surprised to learn that a court of first view in Northern Ireland somehow or other had precedential binding effect throughout the rest of the United Kingdom, particularly given the devolution and the want to make it as close to federalism as is possible, that a regional court somehow uh, it has a writ that runs the country wide. Uh, the only constraints that are going to be imposed there uh, are res judicata issues, not stare decisis issues. So I don't know why they would advert to that. And moreover, they incorrectly state what the actual state of the law is. They misrepresent what the actual holding in the case was. The holding in the case was that benign motives do not license discrimination. Well, of course, that's true. And that's statutory law in the United Kingdom. <laughs> you know, the law doesn't say it's not discrimination if your motives are benign. There are statutory requirements for when you can deviate from the general rule. And if you meet those statutory requirements, no discrimination, no legal, no unlawful discrimination has, uh, has happened. So be careful in using spurious sources. Um, you know, don't be a feminist arguing for the wage gap, as I warned you about and as you ignored. So uh, don't go to law enforcement to talk about contract law or to talk about employment law. Those are lawyers' questions. Another, oh, by the way, here's another good police question that most cops won't get correct. And incidentally, most lawyers might get it wrong, too. Can a person be charged and properly charged for trespassing or unlawful entry on property on which they have an absolute right to, uh, to be on? It's a very interesting question. Uh, it's a very interesting legal question. But anyway, uh, I would also be very careful about uh, which lawyers, uh, what guys a lawyer is in when you're listening to their advice. If they're an advocate for a client, which is what's happening uh, in the background of the case you're citing, you shouldn't listen to them because they're not, uh, they're not trying to explain the law to you. They're trying to give you the view of their client. They're trying to give their client's best possible argument uh, which may or may not be entirely legally accurate. As Justice Scalia, I realize he's an American judge and not a UK judge, but uh, the reason that this is germane in both of our countries is because we're both based off of the same basic underpinning of the legal system. And so this proposition is true. Uh, as Justice Scalia put it, 
in every case, half of the lawyers are trying to persuade you to disobey the law. That's their job to, you know, give you an argument that is sufficiently <laughs> well put that it will make even a judge incorrectly interpret the law that will redound positively for their client. That's their job. The only thing they can't do is lie to the court. That's, that's the ethical constraint. Even when the defendant interjected this issue, I mean, the defendant urged the judge to make this incorrect notion that you have to negate the higher crime in order to convict of the lesser crime. It was the defendant that led the, the trial judge into error. The trial judge didn't come up with this on his own. The judge came up with this, Your Honor, on defendant's motion. That's correct. But it was actually supported by the jury instructions that were in use. And actually, it was supported by the structure of the statutes in question. The statute in question under which Mr. Evans was charged explicitly said that the building other than one specified in the preceding subsection. But you're not arguing that that was the correct charge. That no, order... we're precluded now from arguing that that's correct. Anyway, no. counsel often uh, uh, encourage judges to do the wrong thing. In fact, in every case, there's, there's one of the two counsel urging the court to do the wrong thing, right? So be very careful. Now, in the College of Policing thing, what's happening there behind the scenes, I suppose, is that lawyers giving them advice. There has been a case that has come up under this law. Uh, the police department lost. I'm going to try to protect your interests. Just establish a policy that says, don't do it, full stop which leads to the false claim about the law, which is that direct discrimination can never be justified under the law, full stop. That is false. It is absolutely, unequivocally, unadulterated bullshit. Unequivocal, unadulterated bullshit. It is, con it, it is uh, that proposition of law is directly prohibited by the express terms of the, statu the statutes at issue. It is just wrong. Again, don't go to the police to ask them about contract law. Don't go to them to ask about employment law. Not their wheelhouse. <clears throat> anyway, so let's uh, go back to uh, what you were earlier talking about when you wanted to cite to the law. And here, uh, the beginning of his video, for those of you, all of you who've watched, I'm sure, he puts up a list of four things that he's claiming, which I appreciate. And thing the first is that this is an exemption that an exception that applies only. To, our, to the armed forces, which is a categorical grade A line of horseshit. It is completely false. And the mental, the deceptive mental gymnastics you have to go through to propose this outright fabrication is astounding. So he goes to the uh, Discrimination Act of 1975, and he puts up on the screen something from Part 8. Well, you might, if you look at the screen, it's on the upper left, it says Part 8. You might notice that before Part 8, there's Part 1, Part 2, Part 3, Part 4, Part 5, Part 6, and Part 7. All of which contain some kind of exceptions. This is not now and never has been an exclusive uh, exemption that's available only to the law, uh, only to the armed forces. But it gets even worse for Noel Plum because he mentions that it was amended by a uh, later statutory enactments of Equality Acts in the 90s and one in 2010. That is the understatement of the video. Uh, it is a bit like um, reading a discharge paper from, I don't know, an emergency room that where a person's been the victim of a, a stabbing or a shooting and they come in and uh, the surgeons are working on him and the guy dies! He's just dead! And the, uh, the physician goes to talk to the family and summarize the discharge findings after the body's been turned over to the coroner and describes it thusly. Well, he came in in poor condition, which, uh, which is now stable, and he has been discharged in, into, uh, <laughs> into the care of a, of a doctor who specializes in people with his condition. His condition is fucking death. It is a way of stating something that is, is <laughs> true, but is spun in such a way that it leaves you to draw a completely wrong inference. And then, Noel Plum, and then, and then, you say that your, your quest is to have that Part 8 section repealed. Guess what, motherfucker? It was repealed, and the way you know it is by reading your own link, which has F1, F1, it's a hyperlink, beside every little citation in there. If you click it, it goes to a little thing and it says, 
This act was repealed in 2010. And if you click it and go to the 2010 legislation and the little um, chart it has, it says, uh, where it talks about the scope of the act that was repealed, and it says, the whole act. You are quoting from a law that was and no longer is and are pretending that it is still law. And then you whine about my ignorance of UK law. Instead of talking about a law that was and isn't, let's talk about a law that is, in fact, extant. Which, by the way, I didn't have to read any of this before my first video. It's because I have a good background in the law. And I know what legislators and legislatures do in respect of this, this kind of legislation. There are always a multitude of exemptions, and then exceptions from the exemptions, and then exclusions to the exceptions to the exemptions. They are multifarious in this type of uh, legislation. So here, armed. this is the law that actually exists as opposed to the one that doesn't exist, which is the one that Noah Plum wants his uh, viewers to think is the actual state of the law. It says, armed forces, these are the exceptions, uh, armed forces, one, a person does not contravene section 391A or C or 2B by applying in relation to service in the armed forces a relevant requirement if the person shows that the application is a proportionate means of ensuring the combat effectiveness of the armed forces. Two, a relevant requirement is a requirement to be a man, B, a requirement not to be a transsexual. Ooh. Well, he claims this is an exclusive exemption for the armed forces. Well, same page, the paragraph b uh, before. Religious employment. A person, A, does not contravene a provision mentioned in subparagraph sub 2 by applying in relation to employment a requirement uh, to which subparagraph 4 applies if A shows that the provisions uh, and the provisions that are relevant here are A, section 39, 1A, or C, or 2B, or C. So, in, in, including all of the exemptions given to the law, uh, sorry, given to armed forces, there is an even wider exemption specifically enumerated for religious organizations. So uh, for the armed forces, it's 391A or C or 2B. For religious organizations, it's 391A or C or 2B or C. That is sufficient to destroy his whole argument, but I'm not done yet. If uh, you go up to the top of the page where it says general, exemp general exemptions, one, a person A does not contravene a provision mentioned in subparagraph 2 by applying relation to work a requirement to have a particular protected characteristic if A shows that having regard to the nature or context of the work, A, it is an occupational requirement, B, the uh, application of the requirement is a proportionate means of achieving a legitimate aim, and C, the person to whom A applies the requirement does not meet it, or A has reasonable grounds for, it, uh, for not being satisfied that the person meets it. The provisions are 391A or C, or 2B or C. So there's a general exemption available to all employers in the United Kingdom, everywhere, without exception, to all employers throughout the whole country, the same exemption available to the armed forces if they meet the criteria. So that's a general exemption. And then there's the nuclear general exemption, which is that the whole act is rendered uh, ineffectual if a person acts in the interest of national security. Now, why is it that there is, is, is the armed forces, why is that uh, like written there with a special exemption as opposed to just leaving it under the general exemption and then let them litigate it? Well, as Noel Plum notes, uh, you could get some litigation arising and that's why the law, uh, that's why armed forces gets this particular exemption. No, well, the reason they get it specified in the way that they do is to make explicit what is implicit what is a necessary consequence of the general exemption. And they do this for uh, a couple of reasons. One is the hyper litigious people, they want to forestall, so that's saving the, the armed forces money, because the armed forces will win those cases anyway, uh, by and large, because they will be able to satisfy all the statutory requirements. The only difference is that most organizations won't be able to uh, satisfy the statutory requirements because they don't have a particular reason to prefer a man over a woman because, you know, who who runs the thing over the uh, the checker at Tesco? Whoever does the beep beep, it doesn't particularly matter. The person who's humping you know a thirty pound rifle on a radio, it's gonna matter. So it, the armed forces is going to meet the general exemption, uh, in pretty much most of the time. The only difference is is when do you uh, resolve the litigation? Before it starts 
or after it's finished. If you stop it before it starts, you save money. If you wait until it runs its course, you imperil uh, the function of the military and you cost it needless money for cases that are completely without merit, which it should win, but won't win because of the hyper-litigious nature of the people who are interested in getting these laws reversed who can't win in the legislature, and because legislators, individual parliamentarians, are aware of a problem that, uh, that infects your judiciary that also infects our judiciary. And the problem is willful judges. These types of little uh, carve-outs are warning shots to judges. Do not fuck with us on this, because we're serious. That's why they're there, and it's also to the, the hyper-litigious uh, would-be litigants. Don't fuck with us. We are not only giving these general exemptions, we are also going to fortify it by making explicit what is implicit in the general language. And one of the reasons for it is that litigants will go in and say because the statute is broad, it's vague and incomprehensible and ambiguous, and therefore their client should win. They will lose the majority of time, but the problem is, is they don't lose until the end of the fucking litigation. Uh, the entire point of having a law to forestall that litigation is to save people the ha hassle of having to go through it when they really don't need to go through it, which uh, through forum shopping and a whole bunch of other little clever and uh, unethical uh, behaviors of lawyers, uh, they can always find a way to get it into the system to stay there. Now, the second major threat I want to talk about is your complete fucking ignorance and distortion of medical science. Now, I put it to you directly that this test that uh, the Royal Air Force does is a, a, a health assessment. Now, to, uh, to respond to that, you put up a little general purpose look, looky here uh, on the, uh, the RAF's own website. It has like health and then it's got this little thing and, 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 and there's a difference there and therefore uh, the Justice Car is conflating the one, not the, Ministry of, not the Ministry of Defense. I didn't say the Ministry of Defense is confused. I said you're fucking confused. The Ministry of Defense knows perfectly well what it's doing. and It's giving a general explanation to a lay audience about... Uh, if you read the way they explain these things, they are written for stupid people to be able to understand. You are a clever man, as I said, which is why it's hard for me to believe that this is just pure ignorance rather than uh, intentional deception. But maybe you, you really are just this stupid. I don't know. <clears throat> Your own Ministry of Defense has several different branches, one of which is the Royal Air Force, another of which is your army. Your army does exactly what I described. Now, they have a personal assessment test, and then they have a combat test. The personal assessment is gender-specific, and the combat assessment is gender-independent. Everyone, every swinging dick, every dangling consuelo, has to meet the same goddamn motherfucking standard when they do the combat fitness test. And that's because the combat fitness test, as the name fucking implies, is testing your fitness in combat, whereas the personal health assessment, or the personal fitness, is looking at, as I said, your general level of athletic aptitude, your general level of health. Now, your army doesn't take it far enough. Right church, wrong pew, because they only do one test on the, the combat fitness test for some inexplicable reason. And the reason that this, is, this has arisen is the same reason it's arisen here, and it has a very similar history, though not exactly uh, one for one on the dates. You will vacillate between looking at levels of, assessing levels of health and levels of combat readiness. The one is more difficult than the other, the one is cheaper than the other. Uh, General Mark Hartling, an American general I know, who specializes in this kind of thing, has put it thusly as to why these health assessment standards are uh, not particularly suited for purpose. Because there is a very low correspondence between being in good health and being competent in the battlefield. You are simply testing for two entirely different things. It is a necessary condition that your soldiers not have HIV. It is necessary they not be afflicted from, you know, bro not have broken legs and missing eyes and have you know, advanced hepatitis or HIV or AIDS and all these other types of things. It, it is imperative that they have eyes that work. These are necessary conditions. They are not sufficient conditions. Knowing that your uh, soldiers are sighted, have color vision, uh, have all of their limbs unbroken, are not suffering from cancer, not suffering from arthritis, not uh, afflicted with hepatitis or HIV, says nothing whatever about how well they're going to perform in combat so too will not knowing how well they can jog two miles, uh, so too will that not tell you anything about how they're going to perform in combat, which is precisely why 
militaries are working on developing combat fitness tests that won't break their soldiers, are cost effective, and directly measure the tasks that uh, warriors have to perform in combat, in combat environments. Now, you mentioned the multi, uh, the, the beep test. If you go look up VO2 max, one of the ways of approximating VO2 max is by using that test. It is an indirect way that works most of the time to look at the VO2 max of uh, a patient. Now, if you go to Wikipedia and look at, scroll down, you will find that the American uh, Heart Association put out a scientific statement last year advising that this should now be a vital statistic. That is uh, because it is clinically useful and it is more important to know this fact, the VO2 max of your patient, than it is to know whether or not they're smokers or what their, medical, what their family's medical history is. So when you put up the little blurb saying that it's unlike um, pulse rate and respiration, the, the vital statistics that I mentioned, you are just behind on the science, my man. You should unfuck yourself and learn something before you open your unlettered trap and start prattling out to your idiotic fucking audience about these issues. Uh, science progresses, and you might want to check on this shit from time to time. And what modern science is showing is that the movement that happened in the 70s the, on aerobic fitness actually has merit in respect of physical health. Where it doesn't have merit is in the military context in respect of predicting battlefield conditions. Remember I talked about that obstacle course and the air assault school? I did that for a reason. I pointed out to you that it's gender in independent. It doesn't matter what sex you are. What matters is whether or not you can get from the bottom of the rope to the top of the rope, whether or not you can pr complete all of the mandatory obstacles and all of the, uh, or enough of the optional obstacles. You can miss two of those and still, and still prevail. And that's one of the big weed outs in the course. One of the other big weed outs is the road march at the end, which is also gender nonspecific. And then, so those are the physical weed outs. The uh, academic weed outs happen during sling load, uh, the sling load phase of the course, because it's very anal. If you miss a strap, if you don't tie it down properly, if you don't have a button uh, closed when it's supposed to be closed, you fell out of the course right away, go home, you're going to get people killed. Now, you had a, a, a smarming little backhanded bitch comment to make about apparently the military is just so special. Yes, it is. It is. I, I cautioned you against this too, but you're completely incapable of being cautioned because you're so goddamn cocksure and headstrong and confident that you know what you're talking about. I cautioned you about trying to translate paramilitary experience into military experience. Paramilitary organizations like to have all of the pride of prestige of position of military organizations, but they lack the, one, the two things that are ubiquitous in military life. The risk of actual danger and discipline. The military is special. That's why every military has its own law that governs uh, its soldiers, sailors, and airmen. That is distinct from civil law. You can be imprisoned for being rude in the military. You can't go to prison, at least uh, not in non-dictatorships, for being rude in civilian life. That is because the, un the underbelly of the beast of war is that you have to make very unpleasant decisions. Sometimes you have to decide to kill your own friends. That is a job requirement. It isn't simply that, uh, like, when you go to a fire, if it's too dangerous, they'll call you off and you guys back off for a while and just spray it from the, the outside. Uh, actually, let me back up. Um, suppose that a person knows nothing about firefighting and they wonder why it is that firefighters go into a building and then they uh, rummage around for a while and let the place burn before they put any water on it. It's because, you know, because they don't know anything. They don't, they don't appreciate the fact that once you start letting that water go, what you get is steam. And anyone who is in there who's not found is going to be boiled alive if they're still alive. That's why you go in and look for uh, people to get out before you actually start managing the fire. You save the life uh, and, and then you worry about uh, everything else. The military doesn't work that way. They have to do everything you have to do, but sometimes you have to, you have to knowingly kill your own friends because the mission requires it. This happens in the Navy. If uh, you take a torpedo, even if you see your friend Swimming towards you, you've got to close the hatch and drown your friend. That is a job requirement. Now, you might, uh, in your job and in law enforcement, run away from something. You might uh, be able to be called back, and as a consequence of that, you may not be able to save one of your friends who might get killed 
in a fire or a firefighter or whatever, depending on whether it's military. I'm sorry, whether it's law enforcement or the fire service. But what you will never be called on to do is to retard your friend from escaping. You will never be ordered to grab your fellow firefighter and throw that motherfucker down and, make, and then block his way so he can't escape to guarantee that he will die. In the military, this is part of the deal. Unmasking procedures, the way you do it, is quite different than the way they do unmasking procedures in possibly contaminated areas in the military. Uh, it's a very unceremonious way that it happens, but you choose whoever's the least important to the mission at hand. And then uh, suddenly a couple of people descend upon you. Know, this is a person you work with every day. Descend upon him at gunpoint. Guns at his head. Drop your weapon. Because what you're going to do is you're going to rip that man's mask off or force him to take it off himself and see, does he start flopping around like a dead, like a dying chicken or not? If he does, we know the area is still contaminated. If he doesn't, after a while, it might be safe enough for the rest of us. Uh, so when you work in the military, you have to accept that you may be called upon to be that test case, that you may be called upon to voluntarily, uh, or without any resistance really, take off your mask and let yourself be gassed to death uh, because the piece of information that's going to be useful to your unit to have is worth your being killed in order to accomplish it. That is just part of the job. It's nothing like that in law enforcement, nothing like that in the fire service. You cannot compare the paramilitary organizations to the military organizations because there are crucial differences, cru crucial differences that distinguish the one from the other. You, don't, you do not stand any chance whatever of going to prison in civilian life because you did not tie the right knot in your shoes, in your boots, in one pair of your boots, whereas you can in the military. And it's not just done because the army people or the navy people or whoever got bored. There's a reason you have a not day and a no not day or a dot and a no dot day. I'm not going to tell you why, because if you've never been in the military, it, you, you should shut up about the subject because you don't understand it or you should, you should learn about it. So if you want to find out why you might want to have uh, shoes designated as such and be required uh, to wear one particular not, uh, either a knot or a no-knot on a given day, join the military and you'll find out. You can go to prison for wearing the wrong pair of boots. The boots will be identical. You get them issued the same day. Just one will be arbitrarily designated with a knot and one will be arbitrarily designated without a knot or with a dot or, or without a dot. And if you uh, fuck that up, you'll be punished. Now, usually the punishment's not prison. You don't usually court-martial you over that. Uh, but it'll, you'll get smoked, uh, you'll get counseled, uh, you'll get non-judicial punishment, and in some cases, if they think that you're intentionally doing it, you will get a, you, you will serve time, possibly. You'll get a less than honorable discharge, to be sure. Nothing like that in the civilian world. And the reason for it is, in the civilian world, no matter how dangerous your job is, almost without exception, you will never be called on to uh, put to death one of your colleagues who has done no wrong. In the military, that is just part and parcel of war. You may well have to cause the death of your best friend when he has done absolutely nothing wrong. They are preparing people for those circumstances. So yes, the military does get some special solicitude in the law. Because what they're preparing for is unlike anything you will ever experience in civilian life, no matter what your job is. And if the military fails, all the beloved institutions that you want to talk about suddenly evaporate and they come under a new government's rule, which might have a different set of laws ones which you might find less amenable. That's why there is spe special solicitude now and always for the military. It is the bulwark uh, that you, it is the vanguard that everything else in your society uh, depends upon. It should not be surprising, therefore, particularly given that fact and the nature of war, that governments might want to make sure that whatever may be true of a shopkeeper at a clothing store what, they, you know, what arguments they may be able to make in a court case to defend against a hyper-litigious person and be tied up and have their uh, operations frustrated. Whatever might be true about that inconvenience, the one thing that you can't tolerate is having your ability to prosecute a war frustrated by one stupid fucking willful judge who has some very clever yet hyper-litigious feminazis on the case. Have a great day.